Good afternoon. We're going to begin. My name is Michael Katz, and I'm a professor of Russian here at the college, and it's my pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to this talk. Um, I could start with a joke that would begin something like a funny thing happened on my way to Brazil and go on, but I'm applying for a Fulbright to Brazil, hope to spend some time there next year teaching at a university, and in the course of preparing for that Fulbright, I looked up colleagues who worked in Russian studies and came across the name of the gentleman standing to my right. I Googled him, as any good 21st century person would, discovered an email address, wrote to him, and it turned out that he was in the United States for this year. And as we got to know each other electronically and telephonically, the idea of inviting him here to speak through the IS program seemed to get better and better, especially given the subject of his most recent book. He's a professor of history at the Universidade de Sao Paulo, USP, and he teaches late modern history with emphasis on Asia. He graduated in philosophy from Southwest Missouri State University, also on a Fulbright grant. He got his MA from the Pushkin Institute in Moscow, with which Middlebury used to be affiliated. His MA is in Russian language and literature, music to my ears, and a PhD in history from the Universidade Federal Fluminense, UFI, in uh, Niteroi, with which Middlebury is also associated and sends our students of Portuguese. This year, he's spending as a researcher at the Library of Congress in Washington and through February as a visiting scholar at American University. He's written two books that are worthy of mention today, both, alas, only in Portuguese. Alas, for me, not for him or for some of you. Alas, written in Portuguese. One is uh, entitled in English, The Decline of the USSR, A Study of Its Causes, and the other one, just recently out, Russia and Brazil in Transformation. And that, of course, is the subject of his talk today. Um, I want to thank the Roatan Center, the usual cast of characters, Alan St Alison Stanger and Charlotte Tate, Martha and Carol Ann. Also thanks to the Political Science Department, Murray Dry for support, uh, to Jeff Kaysen and Miguel Fernandez, for additional support for this lecture, and to Scott Witt, who is uh, filming it. So uh, with no further ado, I give you Professor Angelo Segrillo. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Middlebury College for the invitation for this lecture. and. Uh, especially Professor Michael Katz to be the middleman in Middlebury College to get this going. And uh, as he said, this, uh, this talk today will be based on this, my latest book, Russian Brazilian Transformation, a history of Brazilian and Russian uh, political parties in the process of democratization. Uh, it's uh, this process of democratization I'm talking about is the period from 1985 to today. Uh, as you know, uh, Gorbachev came to power in the Soviet Union in 1985 and started perestroika in the opening. And coincidentally, in Brazil, too, in 1985, uh, came to power the first civilian president, the first civilian president after a 20-year military dictatorship. And we had this process of democratization. In this, we have this time frame uh, in common. Uh, It's not? You have the mic. No, you have the mic on mute, so you don't oh, okay. have to worry about leaning over. All right, because I could hear the... Uh, oh, that's great, that's great. Seven feet yes, <laughs> yes, that's great. That's great, I'm going to walk a little bit. So we have this... Yes, that's great. Uh, so we have this time frame in common, and uh, Brazil and Russia also, many of my colleagues ask me, why make this comparison? The starting points are so different. You know, Brazil, capitalist country, Russia, Soviet Union, or socialist countries, different, uh, different uh, paths. But if the starting points were so different, 
like Adam Pizivarsky said, uh, the destination is the same. Political democracy, they are aiming towards that after periods of authoritarianism. So it should make their paths converge at some point. And also Russia and Brazil, it's interesting to see because they are, they are huge countries geographically, you know, they're the core areas of their region, you know, Russia and Eurasia, Brazil and South America. So it's, there should be uh, lessons that one can learn from the other, from this experience. Uh, for me, it was interesting on the uh, political side because in Brazil, we talk a lot about changing our political system to what we call a mixed system, like the one that I have in Germany and the one that Russia had until very recently. The, uh, w when we analyze, I'm a historian, but uh, in political science, uh, when we analyze this process of transition, uh, we, we often have these uh, two very influential approaches or kinds of approaches. You know, the culture-based approaches, you know, that emphasize the culture, you know, like the weight of the past, you know, the culture really influences and it's difficult to change. And we have uh, institutionalism, you know, new institutionalism, which emphasize institutions. You know, uh, yes, there's the weight of the past, but if you choose the right institutions, you can change things radically, let's say. And uh, in these studies, you know, we emphasize a lot the uh, electoral systems, for example. It's very important. What kind of system? Uh, either, you know, you have single member district plurality system, like what you have here in the United States, or proportional representation, which they have uh, in many countries in Europe and in Brazil. And there are different consequences in the choices of these, uh, uh, of these electoral systems. Uh, in Brazil, in the choice of the right institutions, uh, people were looking uh, into the different approaches. You know, when you have what you have here in the States, uh, the single member district, it, it conduce, it's conducive to a two-party system like you have. You, know? uh, you have small districts and only one seat is up for grabs. So people don't want to waste their votes, even if they would like to vote for Ralph Nader, the Green Party, they don't, but they think, that, oh, they're not going to win votes. So they vote for somebody else. So it's conducive to a two-party system. On the other hand, you have, like in Europe, proportional representation. And uh, then, you know, if a party gets 20% of the votes, they get 20% of the seats, let's say. <coughs> so it's conducive to a multi-party system, sometimes four or five. And uh, there are consequences of that. You know, the single member district, they say it's more stable, you know, it avoids radicalism, so it's more stable for governing. The people who defend uh, uh, proportional representation say that it's more democratic. It allows for more uh, diversity of, of, of views. Uh, and some people propose the called mixed system. That's what they have in Germany and what they had in Russia until recently. It was half of the parliament is elected by single member district and half in proportional representation. You know, it's a search for the best of all of the two worlds. And so it's very important uh, for, for us in Brazil to analyze the Russian experience because we think of the Germany, German experience with a mixed system, but the Russians also tried it. So it was uh, interesting to see and compare. Another, just uh, before we start about Russia and Brazil specifically, very important also is the choice of uh, presidentialism and parliamentarianism in English or parliamentarism? Parliamentarianism. Uh, uh, many observers, they say that for countries that are coming out of a, an authoritarian uh, regime, presidentialism is not, is not good. It, it's very personalistic uh, and uh, parliamentar parliamentarianism, a parliamentarian system is, is, is better because uh, you don't have a fixed term of office, you know, so you can, if, if the government's not good, you can change it in quickly and change for a new prime minister. You don't have the temptation of having a coup d'etat like often happens in, in, in different countries. So in, uh, I'm, what I'm gonna do here, it's like 45 minutes and 30 minutes of sec, uh, question and answer. I'll give a general historical overview of the, uh, the, the question of democracy in Russia and, uh, and Brazil. Talk about this period specifically, 85 to now. And at the end, uh, we're gonna discuss a little these uh, 
questions. How does it fit, you know, these different systems in, 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 in their, uh, in their uh, re real experience? In this historical, so let's have a little historical background. Uh, the, different, the, the experience of uh, Russia and Brazil with democracy are different. You know, they had authoritarian pasts. You know, uh, uh, like I said, we had a, a military dictatorship from 1964 to 1985, and, and other dictatorships before. You know? and, it, and Russia had uh, what some call a totalitarian state, even more than just an authoritarian state. Uh, but their experience with democracy was different. If you take Russia, Russia before Gorbachev came to power had almost no experience with democracy. You know, Tsarism, Tsar was uh, an absolutist state until 1905. You know, in 1905, you had what they called the uh, 1905 revolution, uh, a series of strikes that almost brought down the Tsar. And in order not to be brought down, he had to make concessions, important concessions. And this concession meant what? Accepting uh, political parties, legal, legal, legal political parties, there were no legal political parties, except a parliament, the Duma, and accept a, a constitution, that's not no a con. So it was a change from, uh, from uh, uh, autocracy to what should be a constitutional monarchy. But once they got hold of the situation, you know, they, in practice it was not so much like this. It was still an authoritarian state, you know, like the Tsar could dissolve, could dissolve the Duma at any point. They changed the suffrage at will. Uh, so it was still an authoritarian state. From 1917 on, uh, you had revolution, Tsarism fell, but then you had a one-party state. So it was also, you cannot consider that there was political democracy. Maybe the only time in history when, when Russia had real democracy was between February 1917 and October 1917. You know, it was, they had the February Revolution, and uh, Tsarism fell, and a multi-party multi democracy. A little out of anarchy, because there was actually no government, but it was democracy, because there was opposition, no, no censorship. So it was a very short period of time that Russia had of experience with democracy before Gorbachev. In Brazil, in Brazil the, the problem was different. Brazil had experience with democracy before. But the problem with Brazil is that the experience we had with democracy were very intermittent. They were interrupted from time to time by uh, especially military coup d'etats. Uh, so uh, the democracy could not consolidate itself. When it, when it was consolidating, you would have a military coup d'etat and have to start all over. So it's a different type of problem. Uh, Brazil in, in, in the 19th century was an empire, uh, the 20th century a republic. And uh, Brazil is very paradoxical because if you take the constitutional life, Br Brazil had a, a constitutional life that's very, uh, it's pretty old. You know, we, we, st we had political parties in the 1830s. And we had a constitution, it was an empire, but with a constitution, uh, uh, political parties, uh, parliament working. Uh, so we, we have this, it's pretty old, even older than some countries in some countries in Europe. You know, democracy is something very new. We think of democracy as something very old. No, besides, if we take away Greece, whatever that was, democracy is something of the 19th century to the end of 19th century for most countries. So uh, Brazil had this older experience, uh, but it was interrupted from time to time. You know, like, uh, in 1889, there was the, what they call the Proclamation of the Republic. And ominously, it was realized by a military coup d'etat. You know, a marshal deposed the emperor and uh, installed uh, uh, the republic. Uh, so it's very ominous to what would happen in the future. Brazilian historians regard the Proclamation of the Republic as a progressive uh, act. You know, because the empire was not uh, solving the, the, the social and economic problems of Brazil. Brazil was the last country to abolish slavery, for example. Uh, but still, the way it was done was a problem for the future, because we would have it uh, in other periods. We had the first republic from 1889 to 1930. 
And in 1930, there was a, a new revolution, and a very important figure came to power, Getulio Vargas. Getulio Vargas in Brazil is like Perón in Argentina. You know, it's, it's a populist figure uh, that did progressive things for the poor, but uh, that's another characteristic of Brazilian history. Also, th th those were transformation, even radical transformations, but they were controlled from above. You know, populism is like this. The progressive things, what we call in Brazil, to give the finger in order not to lose the hand, you know, but still controlled from above. And that's another characteristic in Brazil. Uh, in Brazil, we didn't actually have a revolution from below, let's say, movements from below that did uh, this transformation, this dramatic transformation in Brazilian life. They were usually carried out by members of the elite, which carried uh, out a, a careful transformation. It was qualitative transformations. You know, in the 1930s, there was the change for, to more industrialized pattern. Uh, but all is controlled from above. Uh, and also, this, we're going to see this in the process of democratization also. So we had this uh, populist regime come to power in 1937. We just had a, a coup d'etat and uh, installed a real fascist regime until 1945. And in 1945, it was too big a contradiction. We had a fascist regime at home fighting abroad, ab abroad uh, with, uh, with the allies for democracy. It was fighting for democracy abroad, and inside they had a fascist regime. It was fighting against Germany, Italy, abroad, and inside there was a fascist regime. So too much of a contradiction. He, this, uh, uh, he fell, this dictator, Getulio Vargas. And another period of, of democracy came from 1945 to 1964, when there was this other military dictatorship I talked about in, in the beginning, 1964 to 1985. The 1964 military dictatorship came as a response, simplifying a lot, no? uh, to, to the populist threat, let's say. You know, there was a successor to Getulio Vargas was in power and doing a lot of reforms, land reforms, and uh, although those were uh, controlled from above, it still was too much for the greater part of the elite to take, and then there was a military coup d'etat in 1964. So in the Brazilian history, we had these two things. The problem is that the, not that there was not an experience with democracy, but the intermittence of this uh, experience was so interrupted from time to time by military coups, and the other is the absence of these either revolutions or movements from below in the transformation. There are inputs from below, but somehow the, uh, the, the, the greater control was realized from above. So Brazil uh, didn't cut the, the, the umbilical cords of many of these contradictions. So it was the last country to, to, to abolish slavery, for example. Uh, the democracy didn't consolidate you know, from time to hour, 20-year 20, 20 cycle, if you pay attention to my, like more or less every 20 years. So uh, it was a different experience from Russia. Russia <laughs> had almost no experience with democracy before, and uh, Brazil had, but it was very intermittent. Uh, in the period of 1985 to now, specifically, let's see Russia and Brazil, I, I will just like give a, because it's a very vast topic, I'll, I'll just give a general overview launch some ideas, and then in the question and answer session at the end, we can go into specific questions, you know, either in Russia that you have or in Brazil, and we can deal with more specific questions that might have. Uh, in, in Russia, the, uh, from 1985 to today, you had uh, Perestroika, it was, still, uh, it was still the Soviet Union, you know, and Perestroika from 1985 to 1991. 1991, there was the dissolution of the Soviet Union, into its constituent uh, uh, republics, and, and uh, you had the beginning of the Russian Federation that we have today. And in this process of democratization of the 90s, 1990s up to today, uh, we can discern two, two main periods, two main eras, let's say. You know, the Yeltsin era in the 1990s, you know, Yeltsin was the president of the Russian Federation beginning 1992 up to 2000. And what you can call the Putin era. You know, Putin came to power uh, first as the prime minister of Yeltsin in 1999. 
and then became president in 2000. Uh, he's not the president anymore, but most analysts say that he's still the Putin era. He's the prime minister of the new president, Medvedev. You know, after two terms, he couldn't uh, serve a third consecutive term. But most analysts say he's still the one that uh, holds the power uh, behind the scenes, or not so much <laughs> behind the scenes. So we have these two eras, and they follow different dynamics uh, in, ec economy, in, econo in, economy, in the economy and in politics. In the economy, the Yeltsin era was a catastrophe. Uh, it was a transformation, it was a systemic transformation that had never been attempted before. You know, a huge country changing from a socialist system to a capitalist system in a very short period of time, the largest privatization uh, process in the world, and uh, it, you would have problems because you know there was a new thing that was being attempted. Uh, but nobody expected the, the the extent of the depression. If if uh, I said that uh, Putin came to power in 1999, until 1998, all years were years of negative growth of the economy. You know, it was like a war, you know, like destruction. Uh, the, 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 the fall of the gross domestic product of Russia in 1990s was greater than the one of the U.S. in the Depression decade of the 1930s. It was worse than the uh, Great Depression of 1930s in the United States. So it's, uh, it was uh, a real uh, catastrophe. <laughs> and that helps explain very much the popularity of Putin now. Uh, it's the economy, stupid, <laughs> people, like people say. Because, you know, picture yourself in the situation of the Russians. You know, Putin comes to power in 1999. Until then, you know, there was a catastrophic situation in the economy. He comes in 1999, and immediately in 1999, Russia starts growing, and growing fast. 5% uh, a year, 7% a year. Huh? And, uh, and, 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 the, and it was not a question that the... the economy of the country was go growing. Uh, people felt in their pockets, in their individual pockets. In the Yeltsin era, uh, many of you may have uh, seen that, the, the, the state uh, salaries, state pensions were in, in arrears. Sometimes many months. People would go like five months, seven months without salary. Uh, Putin arrived and in less than a year he paid back these arrears. Of course, uh, that's one lucky guy. You know. Uh, he, uh, it doesn't matter. And the, for the population, he solved the problem. Of course, he came in 1999. Uh, he came after the, uh, the situation hit rock bottom, you know, which was in August 1998. The financial crisis was a fi financial crisis uh, in Russia that had uh, consequences all over the world. And uh, almost by definition, you know, after the rock bottom, the situation tends to get better because it can't get worse than the bottom. So he came after that, which was good, and he was doubly lucky because in 1999, 2000, the prices of oil started growing very fast. You know, they went 10 times higher than they were before. So a lot of money came in, and so Putin used it to, to, pay back, uh, to back pay the arrears, and the economy started growing. Uh, and, uh, but we have to give due to him also. It's not just a question of luck. He followed sensible economic policies on the, on the economic uh, uh, situation. Uh, for example, the money that came from the oil, they set up a stabilization fund for the times when it would go down. And, and it's been very important, very important now that this crisis that started. Now this money is coming very in handy for them. And, and also they, uh, Putin continued the policy that started with the, uh, another prime minister, Evgeny Primakov. You know, after the financial crisis, it changed the direction of the economy towards what they call the real sector, the productive sector. In the 1990s, there was a lot of speculation in the financial sector. So Putin continued this, this emphasis more on the real sector of the economy, like they call. So, uh, so this is very important to understand his level of popularity. And also, it's very important to understand why for Putin this economic crisis now is so dramatic, because uh, in the two th years 2000, the opposition in Russia didn't know what to do. The guy was so popular that uh, how can they beat them? You know, it's, it's only if the source of his leg legitimacy suffered a blow. And, and that's what, what this crisis can do. Because if the crisis deepens, 
you know, the Russian people can start uh, getting uh, against Putin, especially because Putin now is a prime minister and that's the front line. Sometimes the president is a little more farther away. So this is uh, very important. So the economic side, two different dynamics completely, in the Yeltsin era, the Putin era. On the political side, also different dynamics. In the Yeltsin era, with all the problems, especially if you take away 1993, it was an era of relative uh, uh, freedom, political freedom. You know, there were opposition parties, opposition newspapers, uh, free speech mostly. Uh, uh, and when people, in the years 2000, when Putin came to power, he re-centralized uh, power in a way that some uh, observers, for example, Freedom House, you know, that organization that ranks democracy in the world, considers that from 2004 on, Russia cannot be considered a democracy anymore. They, they rank it as a non-free country. Uh, it's a big discussion we can argue later because uh, theoretically they, they still have opposition parties, opposition uh, newspapers. It's a big discussion, but uh, it's a different dynamic from the 1990s for sure on the political uh, aspect. As far as the political parties in Russia, uh, it's very important, we were talking uh, uh, in the beginning about the institutionalism. Uh, one very important thing when you study political parties is the level of uh, institutionalization of the party system. You know, the, the roots that it has in society. You know, if the parties, they really have an independent life or they, be, they depend on a, on a leader <laughs> or, or just a leader or something. And in Russia, the level of consolidation of the parties and the party system is still very low. Uh, many of the parties, you know, sometimes they would create a party just to support one ruler and then this party would uh, win the election and then it would disappear in the next election. Uh, uh, that was like that in 1995 in order to support uh, Prime Minister Chernomirdin and Yeltsin in 1996. They created the uh, Nashdom Rasiya our house is Russia, it's a party. You know, they elected, and then the next election in 1999 had disappeared. They created another party in 1999 to support Putin, Dinsiva, uh, unity. It elected Putin and then it disappeared again. The, now the, the, it's important to notice that the, both Yeltsin and Putin were not members of party. They were not elected as members of the party. Uh, the, it's the parties, political parties that support the president, not the other way around. Uh, so, uh, but now you have the uh, United Russia is the party that supports Putin and has the overwhelming majority of the Duma. And it has already lived through two elections, uh, which is a record in, with that, with that uh, framework we saw. So there is a, a tendency that maybe the party system will consolidate, especially if United Russia can become a real party and not something that Putin changes his idea and dissolves the party like in one year from now or something. So there is a little tendency now to consolidation, but it's still low. Uh, if you talk about uh, uh, institutionalized parties, more consolidated, uh, maybe there's only one party, which is the Communist Party. That's a party that has a, a strong roots, uh, has a, a militancy, it has a program that it follows, because it, it, it falls back on the traditions of the Communist parties, which have a long history there. Uh, it's, it, the Communist Party used to be the, the most voted party. Uh, it was the, the most voted party. Uh, now it's the second most voted party. After United Russia, you know, Putin became so popular, United Russia became the, uh, the most voted, and the Communists are the second. And the third is the Liberal Democratic Party, which has nothing of liberal or <laughs> of democratic. It's, it's a neo-fascist party with uh, Zhirinovsky, maybe you have heard probably. And, uh, um, and, and the fourth party, there are only four parties, oh, only since relative, uh, uh, Russia, just Russia, uh, we, which is a, a creation, a recent creation. I don't know even if it's gonna last in ne uh, the next election. There, there were liberal parties uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in the parliament but they didn't, they couldn't, uh, the liberals, uh, with, with the popularity of Putin, that gave a, a new way that's not a communist way, not a communist path, but it's not a liberal path 
that was very discredited with Yeltsin in the 1990s. So the liberals are very lying low now in, in Russia, and they, they couldn't pass the threshold of 7%. You have to have at least 7% to get into the Duma as a party. And the two parties, the, the former SPS and Yabloka, the two liberal parties are out of the Duma. They are not represented in the Duma now, and they are uh, lying low. So in Russia, the party system is not uh, consolidated. Maybe it's starting to have these tendencies now, but it's still a very low level of institutionalization and consolidation. In Brazil, uh, it, it's a little different. Uh, we, we're going to see. Maybe reflecting, we are talking about the culture-based approach that emphasizes the culture, you know, the weight of the past. Maybe reflecting a little of the of the past of Brazil with more experience with democracy before, there are the. Uh, the party system is a little more institutionalized. There, there are quantitative, uh, uh, there are quantitative ways to measure that. So uh, it's, a, it's it's more institutionalized than in Russia. And wh what do you have? Oh, I have something to write here that helps when you start giving acronyms in other languages. Uh, we saw that in 1985. It was the end of the 20-year military dictatorship, the latest dictatorship in Brazil, no? from 1964 to 1985. Uh, of course, it was not in 1985 that instantaneously the dictatorship uh, fell. Uh, it actually didn't fall, it didn't crumble. Reflecting what we talked about the history of Brazil, the process of democratization, of liberalization of the military regime started from inside. The military themselves started slowly from the dictatorship, it was 1964-1985. From 1974, more or less, until 1985, it was a slow process of opening and liberalization of the system, uh, controlled from above. Remember that pattern in Brazil? The, the military themselves were controlling, having conversations with, with key members of, of, the, of the opposition. There was pressure from below, but the the, the main process of liberalization was not was not con, con, conducted by the pre, uh, uh, hegemonized by the pressures from below. It was it was a, a very controlled from above process, and so the military started uh, conversations on uh, on how to uh, transition the power to the civilians. And in 1985, the first president, uh, uh, civilian president, came to power. And this way that this transformation was controlled from above was reflected on the way the democracy came later. Uh, remember I said that we had almost like a 20 year more or less cycle of democracy and then comes a dictatorship. We were very afraid uh, in the years 2000 because in 2002 there was, a, uh, there was an election of a, a radical, let's say, a, a president, Lula, is the is the present president of Brazil from the Workers' Party. And people thought there was a, a big thing, oh, there's going to be a, a, a military coup d'etat. Also, just because it was time. It's not like 20, time, 20 years. And so it, it's very significant to Brazilians that there was such a change in the spectrum, in the ideological spectrum. Uh, and there was not a, a coup d'etat. So it's very important. Uh, we think it's an important sign that the, the democracy is getting a little more root than in the past. In the past, we, we could never have a, a change like that. And, uh, and, and this change, uh, it followed a pattern here. In, in, the, in the 1980s, the most important, uh, until today, the most important party in Brazil is right, the king uh, that makes kings, king pin, that makes kings is PMDB. Uh, uh, it's like a big center party. It, it, the PMDB is the successor party of, of the opposition party in the military dictatorship. In the military dictatorship, it was a, a two-party system. There was just the situation and the opposition. So uh, PMDB today is a big hodgepodge of all kinds of things. There are communists, there are, there are liberal, right-wing liberals, uh, because it's a successor of that opposition uh, in the military dictatorship. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're a communist, right-wing, liberal, whatever. If you are in the opposition to military dictatorship, you have to be in the MDB. So this party, 
uh, also because of its fights, it, it had a lot of prestige. And it dominates, it dominated by the center. All this transformation was very controlled from above and moderate, let's say. Uh, I'm saying moderate because compared with Argentina, Argentina is putting in prison there, you know, the former uh, military people who killed people and the, the former leaders also. Brazil, no, the former leaders are free because they had an accord of uh, amnesty. So it's very controlled. This party is the center and it's very important. It's, it's been in all powers, in, in, in all elections, it's in power. Uh, and another reason it's in power, it's also the choice, like I said, of, of the electoral system. In Brazil, we have proportional representation. We have many parties. One party, when it comes to power, it, it doesn't have 51% of the votes. It can't vote, uh, govern alone. So it needs to build coalitions. So everybody needs PMDB to govern. So it's always in power, and even if it's not the most voted. And in the 1980s, it started a coalition with uh, PMDB and PF PFL, which is a right, let's say a right party. So it started with the right, a coalition of the center and the right. In the 1990s, in the 1990s, with the election in 1994, of a, a famous Brazilian intellectual, Fernando Henrique Cardoso, he's a famous sociologist. Uh, with the social democracy came to power, it was a move to the center, center left, the social democracy. Uh, and then in, 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 the in, uh, in the 2000s, in 2002, until today, you had a real swing to the left with PT, Partido dos Trabalhadores, with Lula, the Workers' Party. And uh, that, that, that was a real swing to the left. But, uh, and, and like I said, for Brazil, it was very important he came to power and there was no military coup d'etat. This is a very important, uh, maybe sign of the, some sort of consolidation of the democracy. Uh, but, um, uh, like the other transformation in Brazil, in order to be accepted in power, and also because it had to build coalitions, PT had to moderate its, its discourse. You know, it's, it's, it doesn't govern as radically as w when it was in the opposition. So it's a, like a more moderate, it, it moved from, from, from left a little towards the center when it governs. And it governs in coalition with other uh, parties, especially the, PM, especially the PMDB. Uh, uh, so, uh, in a comparative aspect, Brazil, the, the, these political parties are, 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 they are not completely institutionalized by those quantitative, uh, 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 quantitative uh, calculations that you can do, but they are more institutionalized than, in, than in, in Russia. And some of them are older, for example, than, uh, than the military dictatorship they come from before. And, uh, and very important, this, it's very important, uh, this change from one, uh, this is a turning point, especially for uh, here, it's not so, uh, well, maybe there, with the election of Barack Obama, many people thought, oh, it's not possible that the black man will be president. <laughs> maybe you can have a, because I was going to say, you, you cannot understand, for here, so, so used to democracy that you cannot understand how, how difficult it is to go from one aspect, specter of the ideological to the other and, and still don't have like a, a revolution. In, so in Brazil, it's, it's very important. And how many minutes do I have? I got completely lost. Okay, okay. So this is a general overview. And uh, also now in these comparisons uh, of like, for example, a culture-based approach, which emphasizes the culture of the past, uh, the weight of the past, and uh, the institutional uh, no, approach, which emphasized the choice of institutions. Uh, the main discussions uh, in Brazil, uh, in this uh, institutional aspect, for example, is how can we consolidate our democracy? And a lot of observers think that the, we have the worst choice w of the electoral system and uh, the question of presidentialism, parliamentarism, parliamentarianism. Uh, because 
uh, presidentialism, like I said, many observe it's, it's very controversial. Uh, uh, these are some some uh, some authors. They say that presidentialism is not good for countries that come from an authoritarian past because it's very personalistic, you know, like the savior of the country. And uh, uh, for example, among the developed countries, uh, there's only the United States is purely presidential. All the others are either parliamentarian systems or semi, they call semi-presidential like France. Uh, but especially the combination of presidentialism and proportional representation, because proportional representation means that there's not one party that has enough uh, power to govern, so there must be coalitions. It's difficult to govern. The, gov the, the, the governance is more difficult because you need to build coalitions all the time. The party comes with one program in the election, it has to change it after the elections. So this combination of presidentialism and uh, proportional representation, some authors say uh, it's the worst uh, scenario. In Brazil, in order to, fly, uh, to, 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 to change from here, we thought of, people didn't think that the, the system that they have in the United States, single member districts is good because it's, it's kind of art artificially maintains two parties and it's not considered very democratic. So they thought of the German model as a system because half of the parliament is elected like here, single member district, and half in proportional representation. It should be, have both sides. Uh, but it's good, these comparative uh, studies, because uh, if it works well in Germany, Russia had this mixed system until very recently. They just changed. You know, so if Brazil is thinking of changing to the mixed system, it should study the experience of Russia. Why did the Russians change it? And the Russians changed it to proportional representation. Uh, and... Uh, and then you might say, that, that, that's one thing that's interesting and not many people know, notice this. You might say, oh, it's like Brazil, proportional representation and presidentialism, because the pres Russia is usually considered a presidential uh, country, right? A presidential system. It's not. What people have to pay attention to, according to the 1993 constitution, formally, Russia is not a presidential country like most people think. It's uh, what they call semi-presidentialism, semi-presidential country. It's like France, they follow the French model. Uh, Semi-presidential country is one that you have a president and a prime minister, and both have powers that more or less, uh, they're, they're both important. You know, if you have a president that's all powerful and a prime minister that's weak, that's presidentialism. But if you have president and prime ministers and they have different spheres of action that are both important, that's semi-presidential. In Russia, what they have, and that's why it was so easy for Putin to come from president. Many people thought, oh, he's going to change constitution. He didn't need to change constitution. He can be as powerful as prime minister as president. The, in Russia, like in France, the president is, simplifying a little, uh, takes care of uh, external relations and the military. And the prime minister takes care of the internal uh, policies, economy, etc. That's the same thing, France and Russia. So Russia doesn't have this mix of uh, proportional representation and presidentialism. It's semi-presidentialism. But it changed from the mixed system. That's what we in Brazil want to change to. Um, so, well, I'll open for questions because the time is almost over. But I'll just conclude by saying that in, in, in the end, studying this, the thing about the culture, base, what, which ones are more important? The culture-based approaches or the institutional approach that things that you can change, you know, radically the situation. You have to have like a, a, a middle path between them, you know, because the culture-based approach is important because they, 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 they show that you cannot, uh, for example, go to Iraq and then <laughs> put new institutions, everything's going to go okay like that. The, uh, the, the weight of the past is very important. The culture is very important for the people there. And... Uh, but it's not a fixed past. Things can be changed. You know, Brazil never went past that 20-year 20, 20 limit. It went now. The to, if you remember the totalitarianism theories, remember? They said that it's impossible that the Soviet Union will reform itself. Remember that totalitarianism? It was impossible, a reform from... from they did. The, the, the um, perestroika is, is this thing. So. The culture cannot be absolutized either. But also the institutions, I think the most important thing is the institutions cannot be absolutized either. You have to look for the right institutions, but there is not one fit for all. There is no one model that will fit all countries. You have to 
look for the right institutions according to the kind of culture that you have the, in that country to see which ones will work better. One may work well in one country. We said mixed system in Germany works good well, but didn't work so well in Russia, for example. So you have to have a mix between both, you know, the cultural-based approach and the institutional approaches, and not absolutize one of them. So I think it's good we can open to the question and answer, and then people can go specifically to there. That was just a general overview. different things. Brazil, I think the first thing that they have to learn is that there is not a panacea. You know, sometimes it's offered as a panacea, you know, because, oh, Germany looks like it works well and everything. And, uh, but maybe it will not work so well in other countries. You know, maybe it will work well in Brazil, but we have to, to carefully analyze this and try, maybe try in some elections, regional elections, see how it works. And so that's the first thing. And uh, as far as why it's changed in Russia, uh, actually, I don't think it changed because they thought, oh, this is a system that doesn't work. I think there was a little of expediency in that. They were trying to, I think Putin, uh, he, he actually, he, he follows a long-term strategy. It's not something that's just like, a, uh, he, he's a power grabber, but which politician is not? Uh, but he, he also has a long, a long, a long-term strategy of transforming Russia, uh, not in a liberal sense, not like the outs in the 90s, not that, not going back to communism. That's not what, not what they wanted. But they want, I think, a model of a system of a regulated economy, uh, an economy and a system where the state has a strong uh, presence. You can look back in Bismarck, this kind of uh, different experiences. So I think what uh, he was trying to do is to consolidate the party system a little bit. Instead of having those parties that are created in one election and they disappear in the next one, he wanted to consolidate the party system with the communists. For them, it's good to have the communists as they are now, not as they were before, the most voted party, as a second party to legitimize the system and and one main party, like a centrist party like Ru United Russia, that will control the mainstream of the thing. So he wants to, uh, he became Russia, like Brazil, Russia is full of paradoxes. Uh, remember that I said that Putin was not a member of the United Russia. Yeltsin was not a member of any party. And Putin is the leader of the party without being a member of the party. <laughs> That's something very interesting. So he has an interest in consolidating United Russia, not changing uh, from election to election, like to have a more consolidated system in which the state will have a very strong input. It will be neither liberal, not a return to the communist. So that's why they, they, they change that system because in, in the mixed system, in the, what you have here, the single member districts, uh, people could be elected even without uh, belonging to a party. If I could just go there and be a, 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 be a candidate, and if I'm very popular, I'm elected through that, through that part. And they wanted to stop that. They want to consolidate the party system as it is now. And, and uh, so they changed. They took away that uh, single member district part and put only proportional part with, and that's very important because that could, uh, like I said, proportional, proportional representation tends to uh, multi-party, a lot of parties. They don't want that either. So they set up a very high threshold. It was 5% and they elevated it to 7%. A, a party to get into the Duma has to get at least 7% of the vote, which is not easy. Like the liberals are out. Uh, so for him, uh, I think they changed, not so much because the mixed system is, is bad, but because they want to consolidate the system as it is uh, pre-crisis. And I know the crisis now is changing everything everywhere like it was before. I have, I have two questions and they're not related. The first one um, is 
use the term liberal, and um, I, I think it's different here in the United States than it is in Brazil, than it is in, 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 in Russia, and in the 19th century in Europe. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about it. what is a, a liberal in, uh, in Russia, for instance. The other question is, uh, is, is totally different, and it, you, you spoke about these uh, are both large countries um, that are powerful in their, in their respective continents, um, and have a desire to, to, to move forward. Um, yeah, one of the differences is that um, you know, economically, Brazil is tied to the Mercosur right now, so it, it can involve that way. If Russia doesn't have something similar, it's, it's more like on its own, you know, than, you know, and how did that difference um, uh, affect the, sort of the direction that they want to go and, and the political transformation and get you involved in that? Yeah, the, the, the first question about liberal, yes, the word liberal here in the United States has a completely different uh, s uh, sense than in Bra 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 Brazil, it's more like in Europe. Uh, liberal is not, uh, it's not like Clinton against uh, Bush or something like that. Liberal is, is the theory of liberalism, the theory that the state is a potential enemy of the freedoms of the individual. You know, the state has to be kept at bay. And in this case, the liberals in Russia uh, are liberals in this sense. I'm talking about the European sense. There were two main parties that, of the liberals. It was the SPS, now it's called Right Cause, which were liberals like, uh, let me call right-wing liberals. Let, let me see, everything to the market. Market has to, I'm exaggerating here, resolve everything. And there was another uh, party called Yabloka, uh, it's, it means apple in Russian, which was, uh, we have this in Brazil also, it's a liberal, but liberal with uh, social worries. It's a different type of liberal things. Uh, so the, and these two parties, uh, they both are out of the doom. So for your question, it's liberal in the European sense, and, and they are liberal, these, con these parties, at least in their, in their discourse. And the Russia and Brazil, you know, how do they differ in the way they, Yes, it's very different. What I mentioned in the beginning was just, a, I, was, I was just trying to find a way in the beginning. Many people in Brazil, my colleagues, they said, why compare? They're so different. The starting point is different. It's, it's so different. So I was trying to convince them that it was worth it, especially financing agencies to finance it. <laughs> uh, and just one of the arguments, I think it's pretty neat. I don't know, you think two huge countries that are the core of the areas, I mean, are there things that are similar or not? You know, and, and as I saw, something very practical for Brazil, you know, the thing of the mixed system that people are so much into Germany. And look, here you have this in a country that's also big, because it's very important. Sometimes the size of the country, uh, I, like I, told, I think you, for me it would be very interesting to be on the weekend here because I wanted to see one of those town hall meetings, <laughs> which is something that's very interesting as far as democracy we are talking about. But sometimes it depends on the size. All the size also determines a lot of possibilities. So uh, the, the, it's, it's this, the fact that they are big makes some things, gives something in common. Just the fact that they are big. Nobody can, can ignore Brazil and South America. It doesn't matter if Brazil is in a crisis. Nobody can, nobody can ignore Russia, even if it doesn't have a nuclear arsenal. Just for the sheer size. Uh, but the realities uh, are, are, are very, very different. The way they, the, the economy, the way they. In effect, there is no military coup. Uh, <coughs> the Senate was a good sign of the quality of Brazilian consolidation of democracy. I wonder what you think is most lacking in in Brazilian democratic system and what are the major obstacles to further consolidation? I think the, the most important uh, dif difficulty in the, the Brazilian democracy right now, especially after passing this hurdle that's imp important for us, for us it's very important you know, to have a change from one spectrum to the other. Just for example, in Eastern Europe, it's very important if uh, a country from the right can go come to power after a socialist past. Uh, the most difficult thing is not so much in the political, uh, in the, on the political aspect, it's more on the social aspects. You know, democracy is not only a question of people being able to vote. You know, people can nominally be able to vote, but you know, if people are poor, if they have no, no, no condition 
of receiving education or even receiving the information, they are easily led, they can't get to the power positions. So that, I think, is the main challenge in Brazil right now. You know, uh, it's the poverty question and how to make the democracy not only political, but also more social, to have a more social democracy, more inclusive democracy. That's the, the biggest challenge in Brazil right now. It has been for a long time. programs that Brazil has right now to, I guess, address those social issues, of poverty, um, lack of education in areas, will, will effectively address? Yeah, that's a problems. very good question. And for people who know what's happening in Brazil, with the election of Lula, you know, he used to be more radical. He was never a socialist, uh, but uh, more radical. Uh, there's a big discussion because they are using social programs and some people accuse him of using it uh, electorally just to have votes, you know, giving money to people. They have, for example, like a, a minimum, a family minimum wage. If a, if a family earns less than such an amount, and in Brazil it's really, you know, it's like uh, $30 a month or something, uh, they give money to that family. Uh, this can be used just like it's charity, and then it doesn't solve any structural problems. But these programs, they are tied to whether they have some strings attached, uh, or at least in theory they have to be. Uh, it's, they don't just hand out the money to the people. The, the family, to receive that money, the children, for example, have to be at school. They have to show their, 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 their attendance at school, for example, because the dropout rate is very important in Brazil. So I think the programs... There is always a risk that they can be used electorally, but they, 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 are, they are important because of two things. First of all, when, when you get to the point of $30 a month for a family or something, it doesn't matter if it's charity or not, they need that money. Even if you think in the economy, they'll buy things, okay? If you're just thinking of, uh, you know, I don't want to use my money for other people, it, it moves the economy, just in this sense. But also because it can go more structure in, in structurally because with the strings attached, especially when it's tied to education, and this can make the next generation of that family more uh, adapted to get to a better situation. So I think it, it's positive. There is the risk of being used electorally, uh, just like for political reasons, but uh, it, it's, it's an improvement. It can help. Yeah, I'm a historian. Okay. I hide behind it. And uh, given what you know of Russian history and the Russian current situation and the Brazilian situation, Brazilian history, where is it likely that democracy is going to flourish? In, in one or the other or neither or both? Uh, I think Brazil has a better chance. But like I said, the, the challenges are different. The challenge in Brazil is, especially with the crisis, it may seem like a, an abstract thing, this thing of the social aspect of democracy, but in a time of crisis, like it can get here, if it gets worse, it can, it can be really de determinant, determinative whether the democracy will continue or not, because you can have a, a temptations to, 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 to coup d'etat or something like this if the situation gets worse. So the challenges are different in Brazil, the political side seems to be going well with, with all the problems uh, that you have here also. Things, po politicians that uh, do pork barrel projects, uh, same thing, like here, there, and all this kind of thing. Uh, it seems to be going well. It's not perfect, but it's, it's, it's going, it looks like it has a good dynamic, but the social aspects is, is more difficult. And in Russia, it's a little different because in Russia, the political aspects, you know, there was a backlash with Putin. You know, we can debate this. It's not so easy to, to think of that, but there, there, there was a certain backlash, so they're having more difficulty in Brazil in the political aspects, but their social aspects is better, at least until now, until this crisis. You know, the, uh, the, G, the, 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 the economic indicators in Russia, you know, for example, Gini coefficient that measures uh, the difference in income between rich and poor, you know, they are better than in Brazil. The Gini coefficient in Brazil, it's like also one of the record breakers in the world. And in Russia, it's not so bad. They have, uh, and I think this has a little to do with the with the, the, the traditions of the Soviet Union. They have a, a strong tradition of welfare state still, 
so in the social aspect, Russia is better than in Brazil in this sense, but in the political aspect, it's having more difficulties. Whereas in Brazil, the political side is going well, but the social sides, uh, we, that, that, that's where I have our big difficulties. who went through that the period of uh, 76 to 80, and then seeing it afterwards in the 90s up into the 2000s. To me, the most dramatic difference was, in the old days, it was protection of local industry. It was, let's put a circle around, let's put a fence around local, uh, big industry and small, uh, and life would be better. When that came apart, I think in the in the 80s, late 80s, and the Abertura came in and they, they privatized steel and petrochemicals and uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, everything except for Petrobras, things got a lot better, at least from my point of view. Do you see now, uh, with the global crisis, that perhaps it will be moved back to protectionism in Brazil? I think it's still early to say because the transformations, like you saw, were dramatic. Brazil was, had like a very protectionist system. It started with the military and uh, hang on for a while, but in 1990s, it opened a lot. Uh, I think it's hard to say now, uh, although Lula is more, Lula is, is a little ambivalent, you know, he's, uh, but he's, a, he's certainly more protectionist than the past presidents, the immediate past presidents, uh, Fernando Henrique Cardoso and especially Collor, you know. Uh, uh, so Lula, I, I think the, if the, maybe the conjunction of crisis plus a more left-leaning government, if the crisis really gets worse, maybe there will be a trend towards that, but it's still early to say. I'm not trying to hide behind being a historian in a way, but Really, this crisis now, I don't think anybody really knows how, you know, the depth that's really going to be. You know, we can't tell. It's kind of early to say. But there is this potential. Not so much the crisis in itself, but the fact that you have a more left-leaning government. If you had like a more right-leaning government or more liberal, uh, maybe there would be less chance of that. Uh, you said the Communist Party was the second party in the Russian Duma. Uh, I wonder how much smaller are they than the ruling party, and do they have any chance of coming back to power? Yes, in the last, last election, uh, the, 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 the ruling R Russian, Un Russia United got like 65, more or less, percent of the vote, and the Communists got 13 percent of the vote. So that's the difference. You know, the, it's a, uh, what do you call it, steamroller? Steamroller. Steamroller. You know, the, the Putin stream over. Before, one question that you can ask is, well, if the, if the Communist Party is the most voted before, why were they not, why were they not in power? Uh, uh, it, it has a little, a little to do with the, with the system, the electoral system and presidentialism or semi-presidentialism. Uh, they, they were the most voted, but they didn't have 51% of the vote. So uh, the other parties could band together to avoid it coming to power. But right now, that's the situation. They, they, they really went uh, low, you know, like 69% against like 12%, 13%. Oh, and if there is a, a possibility of them coming back, uh, if the, uh, like I said, the economic crisis, we don't know how it's going to be. If it really deepens, uh, a lot of things can happen. If they continue their democratic system, uh, a democratic system at least in, for, in, in, in pro form or something, the communists can come back to power, you know, because the communists, uh, although they are nationalists, they, 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 they propose a gradual approach. You know, it's almost like social democrats, social democratic parties in Eastern Europe that are successors to the communist parties. Uh, uh, but also, if the crisis deepens very much, maybe you can have a fascist uh, type of solution uh, it's also a possibility. If it deepens very much, really become a big depression for the whole, in order not to lose power, some may grab this, you know, in order to avoid the communists coming to power or something. It's a possibility. 